Um, good afternoon. My name is Rita Blevins. I am the HAR Director of Professional Development. And I'll be here today to assist with questions throughout the program and help facilitate. Um, welcome to today's webinar, How to Make Your Real Estate Value Proposition Recession Ready. For those of you who have heard me recently on Member Focus Monday or maybe in an advisory group meeting, um, you've heard me really pressing the importance of having a strong value proposition and being able not only to communicate it, but implement it as well. So as the market moves and changes, um, you know, you're going to need to stand out. And that's why today's topic is so very extremely important. Um, today's program is the first in our 2023 Shifting for Success series. Uh, each month, we will host a new topic related to the changing market. Um, which will help you maintain a successful business and hopefully continue to grow even in the face of some of these challenges. Um, some of these sessions will be webinars, some of them will be classes, some of them will be full on day long events, and we'll be promoting those in marketing like we did for the this webinar. Um, I'm going to be back near the end of the program to tell you a little bit more about what to expect, um, some other key points and the purpose really of today's very important topic. So that being said, uh, today's program will be led by global marketing and sales strategist, strategist extraordinaire, Lisa Dennis. And before I formally introduce Lisa, I want to remind you to put your questions into the chat throughout the afternoon. Um, you can choose for the questions to go to everyone or just us on the panelist uh, on host. Um, but all the questions will be fielded and addressed. Um, what we're going to try to do is if it's something that seems really um, you know, pertinent and we want to have some interaction, we'll call on you right away and, and handle those questions. Um, if it seems like something we want to address kind of as a group at the end, we'll hold off, but uh, we will be tracking everybody's questions. So don't hold off. Make sure you ask if you think of it and we'll get to you. Um, and then since I know you're going to ask, the webinar will be recorded. We're going to distribute the email right after this, uh, this, this webinar. We're also going to include some, some next steps um, to get you guys going. Um, of course, the watching live is always better. So don't kick out just because you know it's going to be recorded because you can ask your questions and that's more relevant and the likelihood of you going out and watching it later not very likely so um but it is housed on har.com forward slash har tv if you insist um on waiting and watching it later but let's go ahead and get started like i mentioned we have an exceptional subject matter expert today to lead you through the program and yes i'm going to read her bio because it is impressive and relevant for you all to understand what lisa knows what she's talking about i think sometimes people just brush over you know, who's who's actually facilitating something. And I think it's really important to know and understand um, the time and the energy and the expertise that our facilitators bring to us. Um, so with that, Lisa Dennis, she brings over 30 years of marketing and sales experience to us. She founded the consulting firm Knowledgeance Associates in 1997 with a core focus of helping sales and marketing teams see the world through their customers' eyes. Um, she's worked with companies across a broad range of industries, including Akami, is it Ka Akami? Is that how you say that? Um, Akamai. Akamai. Citrix, Dell, FedEx, HP, IBM, Kindrel, Microsoft, Mutual of Omaha, Tufts Health Plan, Verizon, YPRO, and she was a guest speaker at HAR Engage a couple years uh, ago. And so, you know, that's the most important one. Um, she's also the owner of valueproposition.com. Lisa is the value, uh, the author of value propositions that sell, turning your message into a magnet that attracts buyers. And I always say, Lisa wrote the literally wrote the book on value propositions. So um, she's also the co-author of the book 360 Degrees of the Customer Strategies and Tactics for Marketing, Sales and Services, Strategies and Tactics for Marketing, Sales and Service. Um, you're working on a new book, How to Speak Buyer, right? A messaging playbook for marketing and sales. Um, it's due out this year. You have been a guest blogger for Tech Target, Kite Desk, Pipeliner, CRM, and MassHighTech.com. 
Lisa is a member of the Sales Expert Channel on Bright Talk, a member of Women Sales Pros, as well as serving on its advisory board. She was the president of the Boston Chapter of Sales and Marketing Executives International, SEMI, as well as sitting on the international board. She founded the Boston Chapter of Company of Friends for Fast Company Magazine. She also co-founded the group Sales and Marketing Innovators in the Boston area, Lisa has held nonprofit board seats for Positive Direction, the y YWCA of Cambridge, and the Children's Room. She has a BA in writing from Wheaton College and an MBA in marketing from Babson College. Go Girl Power. You have like lots of stuff that you do for us women. So thank you for that. Um, we're so excited to hear from you. And I think that, I mean, I, I would never want to brush over all of the expertise that you bring. So um, thank you for sharing your complete bio with me. Um, so I could share that with this group. So thanks again for taking your time to be here with us. And I'm going to pass the virtual floor to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm really thrilled to be here. This is my favorite topic of all the things that I do. Um, value props are my thing. And so um, what I want to do is kind of just dive right in. Um, and as we go along, feel free to bring up questions. So you know, the the I did a lot of research. HAR had amazing um, information and statistics uh, on the state of the market. And on the one hand, you can look at the state of the market and say, oh, my, you know, this is really tough. Right. We've had 10 consecutive um, uh, reportings of of uh, of uh, uh, decreases in in uh, sales. On the other hand, you're in one of the best markets in the country. Right. And so I actually pulled this up and thought, you know, this is you're in an, an opportunity um, driven market, even in difficult times. Um, and I think that's the kind of approach that I often take. I've weathered multiple downturns over the years. And what I'm going to share with you today is is um, there is opportunity in every single economic situation. Um, and it's a matter of figuring out where it lies currently. And so given um, the health of the overall uh, Houston real estate market, there are, there are things in here that absolutely can help you succeed. And so I felt like I wanted to just start with and celebrate with you um, the market that you're in, because it is one of the better ones in the country, for sure. Okay, so what do I mean by recession ready? Well, let's face it, every one of us is distracted by the constant drumbeat. Are we in a recession? We're in a recession. The recession hit. The recession's coming. Maybe the recession won't happen. It is distracting, to say the least. It's distracting to us. It's, it's, distracting, to, um, it's distracting to your buyers. It's distracting to your sellers. Um, it, 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 it's really a disruption. I mean, on the one hand, you can look at, you know, that drumbeat that's in every media report, every newscast that we see um, and get kind of, get kind of, you know, despondent about it. I, I kind of look at it the other way. What it says is I have to be more focused. It's what it says is I have to dig deeper. What it says is, is that I have to come up with what to say and do that's going to rise above the distraction. And I think that that's really what I'm going to try to help you today uh, come up with some approaches to do that because the distraction is not going away. It's there. But how do we rise above it? So that breaks down to two kind of key questions as a place for us to start. That first one is to really figure out how is the potential recession, and I say still potential because I think in some markets it's already here and other markets it's not, how is it going to impact not only my business, but how is it going to impact my target audience of buyers and sellers? Because you actually have a number of different types of buyers and sellers, and it's not going to impact them all the same. So hold on to that thought as we move forward. The other question, and everybody asks me this, what do I say now to shift my message in both my marketing content and my sales conversations, right? Given what's going on around me, what do I say now? So three years ago, everyone's asking me, well, what do I say because of the pandemic? And so I worked um, really hard uh, during the first two years of the pandemic, working with uh, individual entrepreneurs and companies 
to look at, okay, where is their opportunity and how do you speak to the impact that the pandemic is having on, on buyers and sellers, right? And so here we are again, three years later, and now we're dealing with another scenario. And so what I, that says to me is, obviously it's all a cycle. You will have been here before, you will be here again. So it's really about shift. I think that's kind of my call to arms when it comes to figuring out how to communicate with your target audience. So I'm going to take you through these steps. We're going to start with the first one, which is reviewing, right? Where am I now? What target markets do I have? And where am I going to focus more closely? Um, then we're going to look at your own inventory of strengths, because that's one of your biggest weapons in, in uh, diving into how can I differentiate myself um, more in the face of what uh, the market is doing right now. Then we need to look at identifying what's top of mind for your buyers and sellers in your market. What are they most concerned about? What are they thinking about? What are they challenged by? We really wanna step into their shoes. So that identify piece is really, really big in being recession ready. Then using my strengths and what I've identified is top of mind for my target audience, now I start thinking about what to say and how to di differentiate my message. And then at the end, we're going to back it up. Any message that you put out there has to be backed up. And there's no better backup than stories from uh, successful clients, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about what we need to do there. So let me just give you my philosophy about speaking buyer, right? We're all trying to answer the question you see in the center of the screen. Why would you hire me as your realtor, right? Very important question. All of you try to answer that every day, okay? Um, most of the time, like 95% of the time, most of us would answer that question by talking about ourselves. I have these capabilities. I've done these types of successful sales. I have these qualifications. We literally talk about ourselves. Here are the reasons why you want to hire me. However, there's a bit of a challenge there. And that challenge is while they're asking that question, they're asking it from their own frame of reference and where your quote unquote, and I mean buyer, whether they're buying a house or selling a house, right? I'm going to use the word buyer here in a more general sense. Um, their number one top of mind concern is themselves, right? So they only want to hear about you to the extent that it's relevant to what's in their head, what they're concerned about, their point of reference, their needs, their challenges, their worries, right? So so what I'm going to introduce here and what I'm going to kind of walk you through is how to flip from speaking about yourself, right, to speaking buyer language, to speaking from a buyer point of view. Because I'm going to tell you, they are a lot more interested in themselves than they are in, are in you. Even when they're shopping around for an agent or a broker, their number one concern is themselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, play to that. That's going to be really important for us to hear. So right now, what are they worried about, right? Well, demand in the market is decreasing, right? We've seen home sales go down significantly, 29% from the report that I just saw on HAR. Um, and that's of concern. That's a real concern, right? And that's a concern for a seller. That's a concern um, for a buyer. Am I going to have to compete more? And that's a concern for someone in the real estate business, okay? Then you've got interest rates, right? That's a whole other thing um, that we're all eyeballing. I'm in the process of building a house right now. Talk about the worst time in the, in the world to be building a home. And I'm eyeballing those interest rates like every hour on the hour practically, right? So that's also causing challenges, right? And that is resulting in folks having to really, really think through um, 
the decisions they're making. Right. I mean, I'm going through that right now with myself. Do I do I build now? Do I hold out for a year? What does that really look like? Is that going to change things? It, 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 those all of those concerns are floating around your target audience right now. OK, and that's something we have to think about. But on the flip side of it, there's a number of things that aren't changing at all. One of them is that as an agent and a broker, I still need to generate leads. I still need to identify and find people who are ready, willing, and able to participate in the market. Um, I still need to build a pipeline, right? And that doesn't go away when times are bad at all. In fact, there's more pressure on it. And I still need to make money, right? So, so those two things, while they are uh, diametrically opposed on one level, they also are uh, really connected. And they're connected in that what it means is I have to go in and focus more on where there is opportunity because in a tough market, in a recession driven market, um, all opportunity is not the same, right? There'll be areas where there isn't opportunity. There'll be areas where there's not a possibility and there are areas where there will be. I mean, every the number of organizations that came out of the pand pandemic ahead of the game was surprising, right? So it's something to think about. Not every uh, industry reacts well. Not every um, opportunity is equal uh, in terms of what's there. But what I'm suggesting is you need to dig deep because this is not changing in your world. So what that comes down to and what I've learned um, over the last 25 years that I've been in business um, is when there's un economic uncertainty, it really kind of buckets us all in one of two places. We're either a holder or we are a mover, okay? And let me just talk a little bit about that because I really believe in terms of finding opportunity, mindset matters. Um, uh, particularly as a marketer and seller, and I'm both, um, mindset matters. So the holders, the holders cut back. The holders see that revenues are down um, and they cut back on budget. They cut back on the projects that they would do. They slow down. Um, they restrict marketing uh, dollar spend right away. And I've always been sort of intrigued by that. Oh, it's like, okay, I'm having trouble breathing. So let me shut down my air supply. That's how that looks to me, right? You're making selling that much harder if you ramp back on marketing, right? But again, a holder is budget concepts, right? We're counting our dollars which means we have to do more and more and more on the selling side without the bump and the, and the support that marketing is going to give us, right? So if you're in an office, there's more pressure to sell, right, from, from management. Um, there's more pressure on yourself to prospect, right? And it gets harder and harder because you don't have the marketing in place running to help generate awareness and interest. So that's a holder. Literally what we're trying to do is hold the line. We're trying to kind of grit our teeth and get through it the best we can. And a lot of a lot of individuals and entrepreneurs and companies take this approach. We, we're seeing it out in the media all the time. How many tech companies, I think there's 46,000 technology employees have been laid off in the, in the last few weeks. And that's about holding completely. Then there are the movers. The movers say, okay, here are the challenges. I need to get a lot more creative because what worked pre-economic issues is not necessarily going to work now, right? The markets that I had access to and that were doing well may not be the ones that I have now. So I need to get creative. So the first thing I need to do is I need to look at my current target market. Who's a best fit that I could dial closer into now? So if you make the assumption that everyone you're going through is not going to necessarily be in play right now because of the market, because some of them are holders too, right? Who amongst my target audience do I think could be focused on? And there may be opportunity right now. This is a less is more strategy here. I'm just going to put that out there, right? A lot of times when things are tough, we tend to go to cast the widest net because we don't want to miss anybody. But actually, the opposite is more effective, which is dialing in to those targets that are most appropriate given the current scenarios, 
right? So that means some research, right? Of my target audience, which of them do I think I could still engage with and what would be the impact of this recession on them? That's trying to dial into what are they thinking about? What are they grappling with? How could this downturn impact them? What this assumes is that every buyer and every seller is not created the same. And that's the truth. We all know that. But sometimes we seem to forget that when we're in a scenario like this and we start looking at where am I going to find my prospects, right? And we start thinking more um, uh, broader because there's scarcity and we, and we have this sort of uh, um, uh, intent to, to, to look far afield in order to find more. And in point of fact, we really want to go closer. The question that we're trying to answer here as a mover is, how can I help these specific targets now with what I have to offer? And that now is in context with the situation that we are in. So really trying to pull some things together here and then to be able to shift my strategy, my approach, my message and move forward. So that's what a mover does. So all of you are here with me. So what does that tell me? That makes you a mover. If you're here, you're a mover. Congratulations. I'd rather hang with movers every day of the week. And here's the deal with movers. Movers get busy. So let's do that. So what does a mover do to get recession ready? Well, first of all, we are really going to dive in um, to your customer and your prospect targets a bit. We're gonna, we're gonna have a little conversation about what kinds of things that we need to think about here, okay? We're gonna take some inventory um, of your strengths and superpowers because every one of you have superpowers. And a lot of times we don't really pay attention to them, but they are there. And it's times like these where you wanna dial into that. We are going to think about what potential impacts or themes or issues around um, this recession could we potentially pull in to what we're going to say. And then we're going to differentiate ourselves, right? Because we're going to actually use those messages and start to pull those in to become more relevant to where your buyers and sellers are right now. And then finally, we're going to share how we have done that with others. Okay? Most of us want to know if somebody is really experienced and we measure that by what they've done for others. Right? How many of you have asked, have you done this for someone else? Right? Because we always want to know that. And we want to see if those are similar experiences. We want to see where the possibility is. So we, we absolutely want to build in, okay, once I figure out my strategy and my message and my direction, I'm going to think about how do I pull together some stories to back it up, right? Because that's the other thing about a value proposition, right? It's not just a kind of warm and fuzzy sort of fluffy marketing speak. It's got to be real. It's got to be believable. It has to be demonstrable and you got to back it up. And that's what that piece is for. So this, my mover friends, is where we're going. So let's start here. This is a standard value proposition. It actually comes from one of your HAR members. I'm going to read it out loud. It's a decent value prop. I am a top producing agent with one of the largest companies in Houston. One of the advantages of working with me is that I am a full-time realtor with full-time attention on your property. I bring customized marketing plans for my clients' homes designed by our marketing team that are specific to you and your home. Our initial meeting is focused on reviewing your home and your sales goals. This is very specific, not a cookie cutter approach. I am available to you directly, your go-to person from beginning to end of your sale. Also, I bring to the table virtual staging of your home and referrals to professional vendors for any house prep you may need. Okay? So, good standard value proposition. Okay? Now, here's some other ways of thinking about this, okay? This value proposition in its current state right now would apply and cover any type of, of buyer or any type of seller. 
This is what I call a one size fits all value proposition, okay? It tends to be very high level. It tends to be pretty much generic across the different types of buyers. And it tends to be very focused on what you have to offer. It tends to be very you-centric, right? If this was a, 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 a company version versus an individual um, realtor uh, version, that it would be the same. It, it, it is, this is about us. And this is, um, and this is how um, we relate uh, and help everyone in our market space, okay? So while that's not inherently a bad thing, it is not really differentiating. And in this, the market that we're in now, right now, this particular value proposition doesn't address any of the market realities at all right now, okay? So in terms of a starting point, it's a good foundation. And what we're gonna do is we're going to take this value proposition and we are going to make it more recession ready in the rest of this presentation. Okay. So first place, first question is where are you going to focus? That's the key thing that um, I want, whoops, want a little class, I wanna focus into. What we want to do is we want to focus and go in and tap into your knowledge of the market and your experience um, to get as highly relevant as you can. So let's start with the, with the market piece. Let's start with the, the, the next step in the process, which is to review your target markets. Okay. So what do I want you to do? I want you to look at the markets that you're in, and and I'm and I'm not thinking about an individual, the, the 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 big you know real estate market, Houston real estate market as a whole. I'm actually talking about the segments within that market, which we'll look at in a minute. And the goal that we're going to do is for your business, you want to identify really what you think might be good opportunities, best opportunities to increase your focus in some segments versus others. Or, or is there a new target or a new segment that I haven't necessarily been focused on, but right now it would make sense for me to start to move in that direction, right? Because we're going to be in this state that we're in for another year. You know, it's going to be up and down. It's going to be clear. It's going to be unclear. Things are going to be shifting. So there is time to move into other areas if that makes sense. So I want to kind of open the door around that. So the first question is, where is your sweet spot? Where do you, where are you the most successful, right? Um, and uh, I pulled this off of HAR as well. And um, I would like to have, uh, I would like to have people think about, and why don't you drop into the chat? I just saw that Rhonda did that. It's a great idea. I'd like everybody to drop into the chat right now. If you have a sweet spot, what is it? out of all of these, right? Because I think that's really, really important to get your hands around, right? You can have more than one sweet spot, by the way. You can. Um, and that's something that I think is important to think about. You also want to think about, um, you know, are there any areas in there where I could move or add? What's really interesting is seeing the, the grouping here. We've got a, we've got a lot of single family but we've got a bunch of others as well, which is really great. So that just shows you how diverse uh, this audience is and how diverse the market is, right? And I think the other piece of this is, is that where you are specializing, where you feel the most strong and the most competent is a really great basis to focus. So that could be really, really important, okay? So the first thing I want you to think about is of all of these, where do I want to really focus? Now we're going to have to balance that against what is that particular segment doing right now in the market? Am I in a segment and is my sweet spot segment the one that's suffering the most? Okay, I'm going to have to really dig deep for a good message there. Or do I want to think about pivoting to one of these other areas that I have some experience or where I think there's more opportunity? That's a decision you're going to have to make. And I would highly recommend that you kind of research 
what's going on in each of the segments that you're considering um, to go around uh, to make some of those decisions. So I think that's really, really important. Really interesting to see all the different ones that are here. Really great. Okay, so besides the segment, I want you to think about who are your people? Who are your people, right? Because they're a lot, they come in all shapes and sizes. And I think this is the other consideration. You know, am I, do I specialize in working with first-time buyers, right? Which is, this is a very tough market for right now. Or am I really zoning into fix and flip investors? Or am I really good at working with downsized buyers? I'd love to hear if, if anyone in this group has any, who your people are. And by your people, the people that you are most comfortable selling to, the people that you've had the most success with, the people that you keep gravitating to, the people that keep getting re referred to you, right? Because I think that could really, really help. And there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, for sure, right? So when I look at these buyers and I was analyzing this and I was saying to myself, okay, in this market, hmm, luxury buyers, market's not gonna hurt them that much, right? They've got the money, they're high net worth. It may not be a really big issue. Um, I have a colleague of mine who's working for a local uh, high-end custom residential builder and he's got 11 properties uh, being built right now. So his target audience is really not affected by the recession at all. That's interesting. My downsizers, you know, it depends, right? Do they need to move now? Is it time? You know, they may have some pressures to do that. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of people that are pivoting towards renting um, while the market is kind of bouncing around. So it really depends on where your experience is and where you want to go. Out-of-state buyer, Shiva, that's an interesting one. That one should have been on this list. Absolutely. Um, I think relocation buyers, they have to go, right? They, they have to relocate. It's usually a job, a family thing, whatever. So you want to look at where is their opportunity that is not going to be completely stymied by the recession. And I think there's a lot of options here. So the combination of the types, right, to go back to where are my sweet spot and uh, in terms of the types of things that I will market and sell, and then the type of people attached to them can help you kind of pull together, okay, rather than going after all of this, where do I really want to focus? Because the most relevant message that you can come up with is focused in rather than broad. The broader you get, the harder it is for individuals to determine if you're a good fit for them or not, if you're relevant to them or not, because they are more obviously obsessed with what's going on in their head and they're not necessarily concerned about you. So that's why we want to get down to who and what are, uh, am I going to really focus on during this recession? So some of these questions, right? I'm going to, I've listed the questions, even though I've talked about them uh, over those last two slides, I just want to list them again. What types of properties have I been the most successful with? That's the first list I would make. Which of those buyer types do I have the deepest understanding of? Because that's going to really matter. We want to get in their heads. So who do you really get? Who do you really understand there? I would even say if there's a buyer type that you want to move into and you don't necessarily have a ton of information, you might want to do some research and you might want to actually talk to some people. I'm always picking up the phone and talking to people about, you know, what their experience is and what they're thinking about and, and how do they think about approaching it. So you can always do that. Um, what are you known for in your own market or in your own office, in your own business? You know, if, if somebody is talking about you, what would they say in terms of what you're known for? That's really important because that can also shed some light on where your specialty actually is. I've asked these questions before and I've had you know, several people say to me, you know, I don't know that I specialize. I, I'm, uh, I, I kind of do a little bit of everything. I think if you really think about it and you look at, look at your sales for the past year, here's, a, here's a, a, a good exercise to do. Look at your sales, say for the last couple of years. Let's, let's do that because it's been an interesting ride, right? And look at what types of, um, what types of deals have I done and what types of buyers have I done them with, right? 
and see if there's any patterns there, because that will also tell you where you've been the most successful. So that's another way of getting sort of a little bit more data on helping you make this targeting decision. Another way of thinking about it is what geography or locations do you have deep knowledge of? Okay. Are there particular neighborhoods or, or, or areas or locales where you really have a lot of, a lot of experience or a lot of knowledge? Uh, uh, or let's take the opposite of that. Where do you want to specialize? Right. You can also do a lot of research and learn about an area where you think there's opportunity where you may not have played as much, but you can certainly do um, you can certainly do a lot of learning that will help you understand where you're going. Lisa, you're you're probably going to get to this, but um, we did have the question and I was kind of thinking about it, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of the situations are that agents are new. Um, brand new, right? And so maybe haven't had any experience. So can you kind of share a little bit of that or let us know if you're probably going to get to that in a bit? Let me say this about, and I saw that question pop up. So the, the thing with when you're new, it, it, there's, it's a, there's a plus and a minus to that, right? So you don't necessarily have the experience behind you. Um, but what it means is that you have an open field as well. And I always look at that as a positive. So what I would basically do is I would assign myself a research project, quite frankly, I would, I would say, okay, let me think this through. Let me look at, and you're going to get these slides. You'll have some of the last, you know, the information from the last two slides about the types of property and the, um, and the buyer types is let me make some assumptions about which of these might be interesting to me. And then to go online and do as much research about them as possible right? What can I learn about um, those particular areas or those particular types of buyers? You also might want to think about who can I talk to? We all know people who bought and sold, right? You know, homes, right? We, we're, we're, we've been that. And so the fact of the matter is, is that my research is always a combination of what I can find online, experts that I can talk to. So who in HAR can I talk to? There's lots of resources as a member and there's tons of great data and information, and I would dig into that. And then I would also have some conversations, right, with people who have bought or sold homes um, or property in the last few years that you know. Like come up with a set of questions around what are you, were your biggest concerns? Um, what were the most important things that you were looking for um, in doing a transaction like this? What kinds of things did you wanna hear from your, uh, your agent? right? To get an arm, uh, your arm around, what does that really look like? The other thing I would do is I would actually interview some agents that you know. When I started in consulting 24 years ago, I had hired consultants, but I'd never been one. I was working in a corporate environment. I had no idea what I was doing, none. And the first thing I did is I said, well, I know four people who I've hired as consultants in my, you know, in my work, multiple times, and I know them. I'm going to take each one of them out to lunch, and I'm going to ask them how they got started and what advice they would give me. If you're a new agent, I would, I would absolutely take some agents out to lunch and pick their brains. That's that makes great. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Great advice. Um, one of the other things I was kind of thinking of, and um, I'll, you know, you're the expert, so I don't want to lean in and, and speak out of turn, but we talk about who are your people, right? Um, a lot of new agents had jobs before, a lot of school teachers or people that worked in various um, professional fields outside of, you know, teaching, maybe like really understanding what kinds of programs, products, and services are out there available for those type of um, folks, right? Like looking at what programs might be out there for veterans or school teachers. There you go. So, um, looking at, you know, for new agents, there is challenges, but I think there's a lot of opportunities there too. They just have to kind of dive in and think about things differently. You also have to, here's another thought reader. You also have to assess your network. Okay. So when you're in a business like this, your network is everything, right? And you start from pretty much what you think is nothing, right? One of the first pieces of advice is I got going into the consulting uh, industry was, well, what's your network? And I'm like, network, what are you talking about? I go to work, I do my job, I work with people at work, and I go home, and I have my family and friends. Well, actually, that's a network, right? It's in several different networks. 
And so the first thing I might want to do as a new broker or a new agent is uh, is I would start to assess, I would make lists literally like, okay, let me look at all of my professional colleagues that I know, like that I, that I, people that I can call, people that I can talk to and, and think and, and list them. Then I would go through all of my friends and I would go through my family and I would start to create um, and I would start to sort those, right? You know, I might sort them by location. I might sort them by age. I might sort them by, you know, are they homeowners? Are they not? You know, that kind of a thing. But to try to get an arm around who do I know? Because your network is going to be everything. And that's a good place to start if you're new. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a great question. Um, so those are your targeting questions, right? That last one. What types of clients are am I most comfortable with? That last one I want to just touch on. Where do I just feel really, really comfortable and natural? You know, thinking about some of the things that I've already done, okay? I think that's key. Um, now I want you to think about that list of types of buyers and sellers and say, given the current scenario, are, do any of them need to move now, right? So let me just go back a minute, right? So let me just go back to this one. Do any of these people need to move now? Well, my downsizers might, right? There might be downsizers there who really need to get out of the house they're in, you know, or they're ready um, to get out of the house they're in. They're looking at um, taking equity out of that house. They may not be as challenged um, by the market. They're moving to buy a smaller home, not a larger one. So that might be something. Um, someone who's a luxury buyer, they just want a new house, right? And they've got the money to do it. That might be helpful. Um, your investors might be looking for deals right now. That could be uh, an important thing. People who can't buy right now, but want to be in a single family and maybe a rent situation might be helpful. Um, your relocation home buyers, if they have to relocate, it's a job, it's a family move, then they've, there's some urgency there. So there's a number of opportunities there that you want to think through where, you know, who needs to move now? That's, I think, important. The other thing you might want to think about is how can I shift or expand my focus, right? Do I go to a different territory, right? Do I move into a different price range than I've been in? Um, do I move to the rental market until for, for a period of time, right? Because that's moving a bit more than maybe some of the single family homes are. Like I know um, I've read that the single, uh, the rentals of single families is 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 uh is is hot right now. So you want to think about where could there be movement, right? That I might be able to leverage, right? Um, and then ask yourself, you know, where do I have a sphere of influence right now, right? Do, who do I have access to now? So if you look at your overall network, and and while I recommended that uh you know new agents pull together your network. Existing agents, you should reassess your existing network, right? Where do I have the best access? Um, where can I reach out and just have conversations and see where people are going and what they're doing and what they're thinking about, right? Um, when times get more difficult, you need to stay closer to your network rather than stepping back and waiting or making the assumption they have nothing to talk about. Staying intact um, is really important. I just sold my home about four or five years ago. I've been in there 25 years. And the realtor that I worked for, she sold me the house 25 years ago. And I, for 25 years, always knew what she was and what she was up to because she made sure I knew. And she was the only person I called 25 years later to sell my house, right? So your network is very powerful it, 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 and, it, and being on top of it's going to be really key. And then also assessing it is where am I light? Where do I need to increase my contacts? So for example, if I want to focus on downsizers, then where do I need to, what's the status of my network? You know, do I have anyone in there that might fall into that category? Where can I go to meet people who might be in that category? Where do I need to increase my contacts based on the focus areas that I might want to um, dive into? A lot of questions. So for the sake of this, I'm going to basically say that we ought to focus on, I'm going to focus on the downsizers, right? Seller buyer, right? On that side. So now I want to take an inventory of my strengths. So 
this is where you're going to go, okay, uh, there are certain things that I'm really good at, right? I want to figure out what my superpowers are, and then I want to map them to the focus markets that I'm going to select for the recession, right? So I'm going to map it to, I uh, decided I'm going to go with downsizers because I don't think they're going to be as impacted by the recession as some of the other buyer types, excuse me, um, because I want to be able to kind of embed my superpowers and language around those, that focus market into my value prop. So let's start here. That um, an original value proposition, a uh, realtor value proposition I showed you, I've extracted the individual strengths of that individual, that person, and I actually worked with her on it. Um, uh, she had actually pulled together the draft and then she and I had this conversation. So she's got some strengths. She's full-time, right? So she sees that as a really core strength and being a full-time agent, you're going to get full-time attention. So that was one of the strengths. Um, the fact that there's an outside marketing team that's going to completely customize the plan. She saw that as a real strength she brought to the table. She's the go-to for whatever happens. Another strength, right? Top producer that gives people a lot of confidence that the house is going to get uh, sold. So that's a great thing. Um, the fact that she invests in them and spends actual dollars on these transactions, that could be a really important strength um, that a seller could appreciate. And then um, we have lots of places I can refer you to, to help you get ready, right? So those were the strengths that she came up with, right? Which is what she, and we actually started with this, coming up with their strengths, and then we embedded them in her value prop, okay? So that's, a, that's the starting point. Now, what I want to suggest is, um, is we are going to now kind of dive in a little deeper on the recession side. So if I go back to my downsized sellers and buyers, right, then what strengths do I have there? So there could be some things that we could add, right? And I'm going to come up with some hypotheticals here. So I actually did 10 deals with downsizer clients over the last year. Okay. If I've got experience, um, then I'm going to use that. I'm going to pull that in to what I have to say, right? The fact that I've done it for others is a strength. And that's going to help uh, your, your buyer or your seller feel more confident. So that could be a strength that I have. If that happens to be, if I go look at my deals, what have I done? How many of those deals fall into the segment that I'm considering focusing on here in this recession time? Okay. I might also either have or cultivate some relationships with some elder financial advisors who can help a downsizer make some of the decisions they may need to make around the, uh, the, the this whole transaction and how they might want to handle it. Some of them may already have some, but there are many that don't have financial advisors. So to get someone to be able to put on the table a relationship that you that you either have or that you establish and bring in to your strategy to provide some additional financial support could be a huge um, differentiator as well. So that could be a potential strength I could add to the table. Um, I specialize working with seniors, right? So, you know, and you could kind of outline what makes you a specialist. Um, if the majority of the clients you've been working with tend to be in the in that end of the market, then whether you realize you're a specialist or not, you are, right? So you want to speak to that. What are the, the kinds of things that you would do for a senior client that's different than what you do with all your others? Because we all apply specialization every day, whether we realize it or not, depending on who we're working with. Um, what else could we do? Whoops. Uh, let's see, they're downsizing, right? They've been in their home for a really long time, maybe. So I would, again, back to the relationships, um, estate auction houses. I actually have a colleague and she runs online estate auctions all the time. And I introduce her everywhere. And I'm not even a real estate broker and I still introduce her, right? So that could be another additional piece of uh, a strength that you could add by literally having that re those relationships in place. Notice I'm getting kind of creative here. Because I'm trying to think about, for my downsizer client, what are some of the things they're grappling with or concerned about or need to do, right? And how can I pull together a basket of things that are relevant and applicable that I can help them with, right? 
And so obviously I, you know, helping somebody with home organization or decluttering and, you know, it, it runs the gamut, moving companies and, and, and things like that. It's a mix of kind of, you know, a standard thing like that decluttering person, right, or individual, which, you know, I could use myself like now, um, as well as some of these others that are much more focused in on that, that buyer target that I'm looking at, the downsizer, right? So they're looking to go from a larger home, they're looking to move into a smaller home or a town home or a condominium or, you know, depending on what those things are, um, variety of, of, of things that could help. So these are some ideas. I am absolutely certain that you guys could come up with others, right? Absolutely certain. And if any of you work with this type of buyer, drop into the chat some of the things that you've done or thought about uh, doing relative to a downsizer client as we're going along. Okay. So now I've got my strengths and I've added a few things in there to make my offer sweeten the pot, the pot a little bit and make it more attractive. Now I'm going to go into the topical side of things. Okay. So what are some of the topics that I could create some themes or some language that could address what's on their mind, right? And try to help influence them because that's what we're trying to do. So what are some of the typical questions a downsizer buyer would be? Oh, Jamie, great idea. Connections to retirement communities. Absolutely a great one. That's a good one. I should have thought of that. So what are some of my typical questions or concerns that my downsizer seller and buyer is going to have? Well, first of all, how long is it going to take to sell my home given the recession? Now, that would seem to be a question for just about anybody selling, and I would agree with that. But if I'm a downsizer, I'm probably, and I've made that decision, I'm kind of ready to go, right? So I want to make sure, I want to get a feel for how long is this process going to take. Also, because I'm going to need to get a feel for how long is it going to take me to get this house ready and to get rid of a lot of my stuff, because I'm obviously moving into something smaller, right? Big question, right? Where are the, my home price is going? Where are they going? Because I'm not only going to be selling something, I'm going to be buying something. And so your downsizer is really on both sides of that equation and really need to understand what's possible um, on uh, from both sides of that of the transaction, right? That translates to this next question, right? So these are just some hypothetical questions. I know you guys can come up with others, but how do I know I'm going to get the price I know my home is worth? And by the way, we, we were depending on the sale of this house to augment our retirement funds, right? So I'm, I'm really concerned, you know, am I going to get the price that it's worth, right? Well, there's that saying that it's worth what somebody's willing to pay, right? But I'm, I think a downsizer, seller, buyer, that could be a huge, a huge issue, right? So that might be something you want to think about. How do I talk them through this and address this? Um, another one is projecting, helping them project forward to where they're going to end up. So where here's, you know, what areas are they looking in and what's the available market for smaller homes there? Giving them a view of what's possible could be really, really helpful. Um, it's going to help them in terms of their thinking about the existing property that they need to sell, but it's also going to give them a view of what comes next. And doing both of these at the same time, not an easy thing, right? It's, that's, it's a huge thing, especially at this stage of life. So how do I give them that view of not only what's happening in, uh, in us getting uh, your house sold, but also helping you to look at and, and, and understand where you might go and what do those markets look like? That could be huge, right? Here's a question, um, and I did research to come up with some of these, right? Should I buy my downsized home first and then sell my larger home? Or should I sell the big house first and then buy? Like, what's the best scenario? This is one of those situations where bringing in a financial advisor might be really helpful if they don't already have one, right? So you can bring to bear uh, some of your network um, and also provide them some more targeted uh, help. So these were just some of the ones that I came up with off the top of my head. For those of you who work with this uh, target audience, um, um, that could be really important as well. Um, Marilyn was talking about you know, taking them to see what's on the market. Some of them may not even know kind of where they want to be or what they are really looking for. So giving them a sense of what's out there um, and giving them a sense of what the market is doing hugely can help really refine the process, right? 
And then where can I get help, right? To downsize these things, because then there's the physical aspect of this. And I know that could be a really helpful thing to do. So that plays on so these questions really align to some of the strengths that I was working through there, okay? And what I would do is pick the ones that really I think are most relevant to my focus audience. And then I would kind of draft, how would I respond to those, right? So the current average time to sell, I'm going to look at the current market statistics and I'm going to help interpret what that means for the different types of potential properties they could buy, right? I'm going to look at and help them understand what the trends have been um, in, the, in, in this first quarter and what are the indicators showing in the next three to six months. There's lots of really great, it was, I was really impressed with the amount of information, uh, market information that HAR puts out. Um, I was all over the news page and it's really great stuff. What's the inventory? What kind of, if we're looking at, you know, a house of this size, right? If I'm looking only for a two bedroom home and um, I want to be in these areas, what's the inventory? Being able to actually research and prepare um, uh, an inventory for them can be really helpful for them to see what's possible. And then really pulling together a package. Here's my, my downsize program, right? And where you could literally pull together a package that you could work through with them. That's customized, right? So it's really like developed for downsizers. You can brand it um, so that it shows that you're really an expert in this area. So a variety of different ways that you can approach this. But what you really want to do is decide which of these am I going to address? And then you're going to do your homework to pull together the resources and the and the words and the language and the descriptions um, that can spell it out for them very clearly, okay? And then you're gonna prepare your answers, right? So you're gonna draft your answers to the questions. You're gonna tailor it specifically for that market. Here's the thing, really dive into that target buyer type, okay? A generic answer isn't enough. You want to stay as close to the segment of property type and the buyer type that you're focusing in on. So if you've decided I'm going to pick two different buyer types, I'm going to do downsizers and I'm going to do um, and I'm going to do the um, the flip investors. Right. I'm doing two different messages for them. It's quite different. Right. Maybe some of the questions might be similar, but my responses shouldn't be generic. They should be they should be more tuned in. Right. If you are unclear what, ex what impacts your target audience, your downsizer, again, I cannot stress enough, pick up the phone, call these people in your network, your colleagues, your friends who've actually done it or who are actually considering it, actively considering downsizing, right? What are they thinking about? What are the things they're most concerned about? What's the most daunting for them? What's easy? Um, nothing better than to actually do some primary research and interview people who are in that place, okay? Um, what information can you provide? You want to kind of draft that, how you can help, and then what have you done for other clients in this area? So you're trying to kind of pull together all of your superpowers, your understanding of the market segment and the target buyer, and then your experiences together, to sort of array them so you can see how they all connect, okay? And again, obviously what you can bring to the table from others. So services, expertise, referrals, right? That just demonstrates your specialty expertise that you have those relationships and that counts. So that's a really important piece. It's not, everything does not have to be done by you and your two hands. What you're gonna think about is, is positioning yourself as the hub, as the hub, for a downsized buying experience, okay? Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna add all of that into your message. You're gonna take that one size fits all value proposition that we started with, and you're gonna start to dial it in using some of what we just did, okay? So I'm back to my standard value proposition, my, my standard one size fits all value proposition, right? Now I'm gonna walk you through piece by piece how I would change that based on the research and analysis that we just did. So the first thing I'm gonna do is note that this one starts with the word I, okay? So when your value proposition starts with the word I or starts with the name of your company, you're announcing, I am talking about myself. I'm not talking about you, the buyer, okay? I'm very much a believer in buyer or seller. I'm gonna use buyer and seller 
uh, because we're in real estate, but I, I, your client, a client focused view. Okay. So I'm always going to start by um, thinking about what am I going to add? So I'm going to make some decisions, right? Um, that I'm going to add to my value prop. I'm going to talk about the service vendors that I could bring to bear. I think that's going to be important. I'm probably going to pull in some pricing statistics because I know that's on everybody's mind. Uh, I am going to have an inventory. So I want to think about that. And I am going to go, I either have, or I'm going to go get, if I'm serious about really focusing in on this market segment, get a seniors real estate specialist certification, right? Because that is just a little stamp of credibility that just says, I'm real, I really understand this segment. I really understand this type of buyer. And I know there's uh, lots of opinions always about whether a certification matters or not. Here's what I would say about it. Um, I think a certification is an added differentiator, right? If you have it, it differentiates you from those that don't. It shows that you spent extra time and extra study on it, and it's a plus. And in a very competitive market, every advantage you can get, I think is really important, okay? So I'm a big believer in that kind of stuff. Um, um, and I think that, that it doesn't hurt. And if you're gonna go in, all in on, a, on an area, because just because you might be focusing in on a target area for this recession period, doesn't mean it isn't one you can continue to build and expand on. There are things that I did during the pandemic that I'm still doing that I did because of the pandemic and went, oh, wait a minute, that's a really good service. I'm going to keep building on it. So here's some of the things that um, we would go through. So here's my new one, and I'm going to break it down a piece at a time, okay? This is how I'm starting it. Knowing if and when to downsize your home requires a lot of thought and consideration. There are financial, logistical, physical, and emotional issues to be discussed and planned for. That opening speaks directly at a higher level, at a high level, where they're at. They're in the midst of it. It's probably a bit overwhelming and there's a lot to think about. I'm acknowledging that right out of the gate, right out of the gate, okay? So right in, uh, here, I'm giving the sign, I'm talking about you, okay? I can help you understand the pros and cons of downsizing in the current economic climate, okay? That's very clearly a place where a downsizer is right now, right? There's a lot of questions that come up behind that, but right now, that pro and con thing, does this make sense to do this downsizing now is gonna be in the head of every downsizer that, that's, that, that's considering it, right? Right out of the gate, I wanna put in my specialist qualification. I am a certified seniors real estate professional and a top producing agent with one of the largest companies in Houston. Okay, so I've got the one two punch here. I'm a specialist in the area that you're in, and I'm a producer, right? So that's going to take care of two things. Do you understand my needs as a downsizer uh, client? And I want somebody who's going to get this done. So I, I paired those together. I think that's an important kind of combination. The most important questions my clients have when they start this journey is does it make sense to downsize now? And what do I need to be thinking about? I'm literally in this value prop using their question, their language, their words, right? I would expect someone, if I shared this with them, to agree with me here or to say, yeah, I've been thinking about this and I'm thinking about that. What we're doing is validating where we are and we're demonstrating our knowledge of where they are, okay? So rather than run in and talk about everything I know, I'm actually taking the time up front to show what I know about them. That's really key. And then I put my office and I have our fingers on the pulse of the current market and will help you understand both the market conditions you are in and the market in the new communities you may be considering. So I'm actually showing them, I know you're thinking about both places and I can help you in both arenas, right? So that also broadens the, 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 the range of what you can do and to make sure they understand that you can help them with both, that I don't have to go to two different people, right? That might be something you wanna consider building in. You may not, but um, that's an opportunity, right? 
And then at the last bit, I bring in the rest of my circle. I bring established relationship with senior financial advisors, as well as service vendors to assist with home organization and decluttering, managing estate sales, and contractors to help you get your home ready as needed. And here's the last line, the key one. My goal is to be the catalyst to help you right size for the next chapter of your life. Okay, nice little bow on the end of that. So you'll note, I changed almost every single thing in here, right? What I did is I dialed it in a lot closer so that it speaks um, directly to my downsizer audience. I want you to notice something, okay? If you look at that first paragraph, that first paragraph doesn't even talk about, right? That first two sentences, first three sentences is about my client, okay? First three is about my client. I don't talk about me until my fourth sentence, okay? And then what do I do? I go right back to the client. The most important question my clients have, I go right back to them. And then I pivot back at the end to myself in the office, right? So I'm never leading with myself, I'm leading with them. That is differentiating, trust me, okay? It, it, people wanna talk about themselves, it's human nature. If you talk about them, that gets their attention. And then you, we end with, and here's what I bring to the table. And that last line is, I'm gonna help you achieve your goal, right? And using that switching from downsize to right size, just a little tweak, but I think it's a nice up note um, to add on, right? Okay, so I just saw a question um, that I'm going to take because um, I'm also watching the chat, Rita. So if you don't mind, where do I put this value proposition? How do I share it? Um, uh, and how do I showcase or share it? So it's a number of different ways. A value proposition, think about that, is kind of the foundation of your message, okay? So if you had a spot on your website that you could you could put this whole thing there if you wanted to right? Given that this is at a, at a specific target market, what I might want to do is pull together some material specifically for the downsizer. So I might pull together uh, two or three pieces in a folder that would break this down, right? I might have a section that had all of my, ref my referral partners. I might have uh, a checklist that had, here are the things to think about when you're downsizing, right? Think about this statement as something that can be used as is. It can be broken into pieces and you can actually provide more content. You can pull topics out of it. It's a variety of ways that you can do it. I would also build it into my conversations, right? So one of the things I often recommend is, is memorize it, right? Or create an even shorter version, right? Um, that you can memorize, that you can do in conversations. Okay. You could break this down into the top three questions that every downsizer has when they're considering selling their home. Um, think about it as the foundation of your message because you can spin it out a, a bunch of different ways. Hopefully, Babak, that and hopefully I said your name right. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so let's get to the success stories piece. Okay. Um, and this is where it's about providing sort of proof, right? They want to know what you've done for others. That's how they really judge. Is this the right person for me or not? Right. And we all think about that. Um, no matter what we do, no matter what we buy, you know, who else has this? I want to buy this thing. Who do I know that has it? What was their experience? That's why we always look at reviews, right? So what you want to do is filter down your success stories to just those that are relevant to your focus markets, Right. So you want to look at how do I amplify my recession themes? That's why it was really important in the front end when we were looking at potential target uh, market segments and target buyers, it's where do you, have you had the most success, right? So um, if in fact you're trying something new, you're not going to necessarily have that. What you might want to do is use one of the other ones that maybe are not necessarily segment specific, but do speak to at least some of the mechanics of what you did, right? But ultimately, I would want to pull um, uh, any particular success stories I could pull together for people that I have helped downsize their home, right? Um, you want it to be a real story, okay? So uh, literally, 
like like you're sitting down with over a cup of coffee and you're and you're saying, you know, um, I met Joe and Mary Smith um, a couple of years ago. I had actually met them at the country club, and uh, they're friends of friends of mine. And, and like literally turn it into a very a, a, a real story, right? With some of the the, the details. And um, I had heard um, through our mutual acquaintances that they were thinking about um, uh, moving to South Carolina. And uh, that means that they're going to have to to downsize. So I asked if um, if my friend could actually uh, make a suggestion that we talk to help them go through it, right? So you literally tell the actual story, right? What you want to get down to is that in your story, you anchor it with the kind of the 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 facts that you've pulled together through your analysis of, of the recession themes, right? So some of those are emotional, some of those are tactical, right? You want to really pull those in and spell out how those came into play during that story, right? So what you might want to do is once you figure out, it's a good place to start actually, starting from the end, is if you figure out your focus markets, right, where I've been successful, if you've done that analysis, I would look at and go, let me think about the last couple of years worth of deals that I've done. Which ones stand out for me when I think about what I've done, right, and who I've done it for? And actually try to jot down the outlines of some potential stories that you can use because they're in your head. And what you want to do is get them on paper so that you have them when they're ready. And I think that's really super helpful because you want it to be very story based because people respond to stories. So it should be real. What was the buyer or seller situation um, when you met them or when you when you started working with them? What were they what, were, what drove their need to downsize? Well, you know, I have three grandchildren. I don't get to see them very often. Like what were the, what were the things in that story that were actually real and pertinent? Because people will relate to those, right? What were the biggest challenges or needs they had in making the decision to finally downsize the house, right? <clears throat> what were the questions they had at the beginning, right? What do they really not know enough about that they really needed me to help them understand? That's key. Um, what help did they need throughout the process, right? So literally, what are the things I needed to do for them or the people I need to introduce them to to do for them? So that you think through the whole thing, not just the transaction that you're involved with, but their entire experience in terms of the help they needed. Big picture, 360 degree picture. How did the story turn out, right? Hopefully that was a happy ending, right? But if they started here, this is where they ended up. And this is how this panned out. We were able to sell the house in six weeks. Um, they were able to get a, a cash over offer. Um, we found them a fabulous home in South Carolina, down the street from the water, you know, whatever that story is. But you want it to be super real, right? How did it turn out? And if possible, can you get a quote from them, a quote or a testimonial? And, and this is something we don't ask for enough, but it is absolutely a tremendous marketing and sales asset. And I literally have a, I literally have a, a testimonial request form that I send after every engagement that I do. You know, if you are happy with how we work together, if you're happy with the outcome you know, it's always great um, to get testimonials and referrals, and I always ask for them. And so I'll ask permission. And, um, you'll, you know, not everybody will say yes, but the majority of them do. So that's the other piece that could be really, really, really helpful as well as you're moving along and starting to do this. If I've done a bunch of um, downsizer, um, if I have access to any of those people, I might even call them and ask them if they'd be willing to do it now, right? So you can always go back. That's the other piece. Okay. So I'm looking at the clock. So let me kind of wind up. Um, putting it all together, right? You're going to review, decide where, you, where your markets are, where are you most experienced, where you've had good success, where are you really interested, and focus. Focus. Less is more. Take inventory of your strengths. What can I add, right? Identify the issues and concerns. Pull those things in to differentiate your message, and then find the stories that match, okay? So the overview is those are the four kind of areas that you're going to start with, okay? And you're going to brainstorm. Once you get all of that work done, all of that research done, you're going to brainstorm, how do I want to pull this in? 
What themes and ideas do I want to use? I'm going to update whatever materials I'm using, or I'm going to create some, and then I'm going to test it on a few people. Test it on some of your fellow, fellow agents. Test it on some people in your network that might fit the buyer profile that you're focused on to see how they respond to it. Does this make sense? Would this be someone you would want to talk to? Have I covered this adequately? Is this the way you think this particular individual would say it? I always get feedback. That's really, really important. And that, my friends, is what I have for you today. And my mantra, which is a one-size-fits-all value proposition, fits no one because everybody is different. Everybody is different. Over to you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great, great presentation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I saw some, some really great comments in the chat as well. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions, now would be a great time to bring them up. Um, we still have a few minutes before we close out. The name of the book is Value Propositions That Sell. It's on Amazon. And it focuses on value propositions in general. Just so you know, it's not real estate focused, but it's across the across the board. Yeah, and I think we put, I think Rhonda Power put the link in there for us. Um, so, so you should be able to get, oh, there it is again. So great. Thank you, Rhonda. Appreciate you doing that. Rhonda's our uh, professional development advisory group chair this year, uh, co-chair for our group. So thanks for being on the on top of it. Um, so thank you again, Lisa. This was awesome. Um, we really appreciate you being here and sharing all your information. And then for all of you that are on the call, it's so great to just take the time to be more educated. Um, you know, this will help you um, not just for yourself, but for your clients. Um, and as you mentioned, each month we will be hosting a new program as part of this Shifting for Success series. Next month, we'll actually have a webinar just like this one. Um, it will be held from 12 to 1.30 on March 29th. The topic is going to be strategies to generate listings in a shifting market. Um, it's going to be led by nationally known speaker Steve Black. Um, the program is really going to focus on social media and referral generation. So looking at that, um, that platform and how do you generate uh, leads and referrals from there. Um, you can, of course, register just like you did for this webinar. It will be free. Uh, we'll also be offering several different programs throughout the year. In June, we're going to center our shifting for um, success series into team leader. Um, full day event. We'll be getting CE credit for that. Um, and, and so we'll be working on that. It'll be really a deep dive in how to transition your team um, to a sustainable, successful marketplace in, you know, sh helping them to stay there um, with the shifting market. And then um, just kind of what Lisa mentioned, you know, HAR is really doubling down this year and leaning into learning. And so we're doing, we're kind of, we're not getting away from having designation or certification classes, but we're expanding that though. So uh, we do have a luxury series that we're kicking off um, next month. And so we'll have webinars that lead into courses that lead into a designation class same thing with our affordable housing series, uh, you know, everything and in between we should have out there. Uh, this program actually today is uh, really a launch pad for our newly made over updated certified strategic marketing strategy series. Um, we've got the CSMS that is a certification HAR offers. Um, we've done a makeover on it. So Lisa is going to be partnering with us to offer some actual three hour CE classes. Um, those will be coming soon. They'll be added to the calendar. Um, we're going to just give that certification a total overhaul. And then when we send this email out with the recording and the slides, which yes, we'll do. I see some folks asking. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be incorporating that list of what the new CSMS looks like, what classes are part of that designation or certification, and then, of course, links. And it'll continue to grow. Um, just to make it better and more um, beneficial to you guys. And um, yes, you can sign up for all of the webinar webinars that we have now. One thing before I forget, I have two different programs that are really important that I think you guys might want to um, get on your radar. I am, we will be putting out on the calendar within the next few days, there's going to be a tax strategies series for uh, led by those that specialize in taxes and financial planning um, for real estate specifically. We're going to have our first webinar 
um, on March 23rd, and it'll essentially be all take the scare out of taxes for realtors, um, and then a whole financial session um, on that. So that'll be March 23rd will be the first one in that three-part series, and that'll be there. Of course, that'll be a free webinar. Um, you'll be able to register for that one the next few days. And then um, we also have our HAR business management program that is a 10-week certification program. There is a comprehensive exam. You don't get a participation trophy. Um, it's, it's live virtual and self-paced combination with a very heavy emphasis on business management skills, um, as well as four weeks of financial aspects and the financial. It's kind of what they do we denote it as kind of an MBA light for realtors trying to build their business from the ground up. So um, that is actually out there on the website right now. It's uh, like I said, 10 weeks, it's 400 and I think it's 500, 495 or 595 for that certification, which is a very deep dive. Um, and then it'll go up another hundred bucks uh, after February 20th. So if you want to sign up, get out there and get it again, it's H-A-R, uh, business management program. And it's on the HAR education site, which is hr.com forward slash education. You should be able to find all sorts of fun things there. We are always adding more. So if you don't see something, check back in a couple of days or feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my name's Rita and I'm Rita at hr.com, R-I-T-A at hr.com. I'm happy to share with you if something's coming up or if it's out there, maybe we're just looking at two different things. So Anyway, thank you all again today and have a wonderful afternoon. Hope you have a great weekend um, and I hope to see you next month at our future program. Thanks, Lisa. You're awesome. Thanks, Rita. Bye, everyone.